Hello and welcome to the Peter Podcast. I'm your host, reporter Taylor Clydesdale, and with me this week is Councillor Henry Clark. Today we're going to be talking about various topics, including the Parkway. But Taylor, we've got so many exciting things we're doing in transportation, active transportation. Look at the bike lanes Mm -hmm. that we've put in, the way we've improved the transit, the walking and so forth. I still think ultimately somewhere the parkway will be needed in some form. I think we need to preserve our options to see what way we're going to go. But let's see if people truly are ready to live what many talk about. And we're also going to be talking about how provincial downloading to the municipality is affecting the 2019 budget. And we're also going to be talking about councillor conduct. So hope you enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Henry Clark. I'm city councillor and representative for Monaghan Ward. And it's a real pleasure as always to be with you here, Taylor. Yeah, so you and your council just finished uh, finance committee discussions at the end of last week? Yep, finished up last Thursday night uh, just after 11 o'clock. Yeah, so I'm sure that's a big load off your chest at the start of your new term. Well, it is and it isn't. We still have to go through council to get it approved. It's a lot of work. Um, I loved working through the budget because it's how you lay out what you want to do with the community for the next uh, immediate year for your operations, but you're also looking 25 years out in your capital. Mm -hmm. And so you can really see how um, we're trying to shape the city. And, you know, what are some of the highlights that you thought were really interesting about the 2019 budget that kind of sets it apart from previous budgets? I wouldn't say there's anything that set it apart because each one builds on the next. Um, I was pleased to see that there was a real interest among uh, council in, in something near and dear to me, which is affordable housing. That's going to be a huge issue mm-hmm. in terms of dealing with poverty. We know that we have problems. Uh, I think I found a way to help them out, which uh, will be subject of a future report. Okay. Um, But that's important. Traffic. How do we deal with it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we all know the P word that's in this community, but right now, who knows where that's going? So we have to find alternatives to that. Um. Those are some of the the big ones that are out there right now. Transit, huge strides forward in that. The uh, the money that has been made available from the provincial government through the uh, the tax from the gasoline and that has really helped us expand the service, uh, improve the frequency, the reliability of it. People looking around can see other new bus shelters. Mm-hmm. So ridership is growing. And those are all things that are, are interconnected, you know, transportation overall throughout the city, transit, the P word, which for those who don't know what we're talking about, it's it's that parkway. You got it. But uh, yeah, there are all these little kind of interconnected pieces that feed into each other. And then you know, also, you know, not so that, just so that people know, but, you know, transportation is also related to jobs. If you have a good transportation network, if you can hop on the bus and get to the north end really quickly... That expands your ability to apply for jobs in other parts of town. Yeah, that's very true. Um, And I want to come back to something because I I forgot it when we were listening. But when you're talking about transportation, my first election, I knocked on a fellow's door who was an expert in business relocation. And he talked about the absolute priority of having an efficient transportation system for the movement of goods and services. Mm -hmm. You're right. People have to be able to get to a job. But you also have to be able to move supplies and materials in and out of your community and around it. So having a transportation network that works is extremely important. The other thing I didn't mention is the pressure over what do we do about the arenas? We've got the twin pad up in the north. We've got the request to replace the Memorial Center. But that between the two of them is probably $110 million. And... Mm -hmm. We don't have $110 million sitting anywhere, but people want us to figure it out, so we have to look at that. And how do you go about doing these budget discussions, knowing that you kind of have this kind of dollar limit to work with, but then, you know, there's this much that can be done? 
Sure. The, every year there's there's more than we've got. That's where we start, and, and you've sat there through them, where we give a budget guideline to the staff. Mm-hmm. We will say, we believe that the community based on <coughs> excuse me, the local economy, job strengths, forecasts of what inflation would be like, we believe that we can afford X number of percent on the taxes. Um, just literally picking a figure, we may say, Two percent on that, and half a percent more for capital, or something mm-hmm. like that. Then it's up to the staff, and it takes them a good six months to go back through all of the things that they know they need. And of course, you can start with the basics, such as wages. Mm-hmm. You know, when when you have a staff, that's going to be there. Payment on the debt, the things that are fixed in time. So there's your building blocks. Then you look at what have we got left? You would be amazed to how little of the budget is truly discretionary in the sense that council can move it around or, or, or change it unless you start doing what everybody says, no, we don't want, which is cutting services. Mm-hmm. People want to see their the, the transit show up on time. They want the roads plowed. They want the grass cut in the parks. Those kind of things. So mm-hmm. that still happens. That's not something you can just allocate money away from and put into other things. Well, theoretically you could. But if we took the money out of the snow budget and the roads weren't plowed, mm-hmm. nobody could get around. Yeah. And, you know, one of the challenges that I think is going to be around for this term of council is related to something that you just mentioned, which is cutting of services. As we're seeing right now from the provincial government, certainly it's still early days for our municipal government. It's still early days for the provincial government. But I think we're, we're pretty much seeing a, a theme popping up, which is them trying to get this deficit under control. And they're doing that by kind of hacking and slashing wherever they can, you know, uh, last week. Uh, we'd seen that you know 400 million cut from education spending. Uh, this morning on the radio, I was hearing about a 13% cut in trillium grants. So these are all things that are adding up. So how do you think that's going to be affecting our municipality? It, it ends up as a download. Now that's interesting. I always thought trillium grants were paid for from the lottery. So what are they doing? But we'll come back to that if you like. But in terms of um, the downloads, we're seeing it constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, when they reduce funds that they are providing. We talked about the uh, the local health unit, which I was the chair last year. Yes, the health unit did have that uh, funding that was, that funding model that changed because the provincial government, they... they, they... Well, not yet, no. The, the, the current government is not responsible uh, for the current issue. The health unit has received one 2% increase under the Liberal government this okay. year. Or sorry, in 2018. But you have to go back to uh, 2015 before there'd been another one. Mm-hmm. So costs keep going up, and the province has been regularly handing new duties to the health unit without funding, saying, you figure it out. Uh, a major one that we're looking at right now is how to check young children to make sure that their vision is correct. You know, nobody wants a, a little child who can't see or can't see properly because that impacts their ability to learn. So there, there's a, a very simple example. The health unit has simply um, eaten up its reserves trying to keep things going and has finally had to come after going to the province repeatedly. We've had to go to our uh, legally required funders, which is the city, the county, and the First Nations and say, we're all out of options. We need your help. Mm-hmm. But that's an example. Ambulance. When Mr. Harris did the who does what, he kept the things that were easily controlled and fixed. For instance, the education rate is mm-hmm. an example. Ambulance, he said to the local municipalities, you operate it. But then they set a standard that the province hadn't even come close to meeting and they demand that we continue to. This has resulted in having to add more cars, more staff to be able to reach people in crisis within a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, This year alone, it will add over half a million dollars to the cost for the city 
something not quite that much, but close for the county. So it just keeps going up. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that you have that paramedic service available in all parts of the county, because I'm sure there are some areas that it's probably takes longer to get to than in the city where we have all the paramedics dispatched from uh, PRHC, right? No. Okay. No. no, no. Uh, I wasn't sure about that. We actually. have about half a dozen bases. Okay. Uh, that they work from, uh, for instance, up in Apsley, uh, okay. Burley, uh, two places in the in the city. So yeah, they're located where the pressure volumes are for calls. Mm -hmm. But if you're way up in the north, say up near Apsley or something, it can take a while to till an ambulance gets to you, especially if maybe one of them's been busy. Mm -hmm. But it is a legal requirement that we meet those standards, and it's costly. Yeah, that's uh, certainly one of the areas that uh, we could see improvement. What are some other areas in the budget that you think are kind of noteworthy this year? We've talked about the, the big ones. Uh, capital is an ongoing one that everybody wants to be involved in because lots of people have their own pet projects mm -hmm. and they're all worthy, but that doesn't mean that we have the money for it. Uh, we've been uh, supporting the Canoe Museum, and, and we'll do that. It's going to be an incredible uh, addition to the city. We're looking at money to help affordable housing. We're looking at hospice, those kind of areas where we try to uh, kickstart. An exciting one that will come online soon is the, um, the Humane Society. Mm -hmm. I was out there on uh, Saturday. My wife adopted another cat. Only have three, <laughs> but we we had lost one, so we were adding another. And uh, just to see the conditions that they're trying to work with now and what it can do, it's going to bring jobs to the community. It's going to help us uh, take better care of the animals. But that's where the city ends up being a principal donor. Mm -hmm. That money gets leveraged to um, help the province, the feds, Charitable donors put money in. Look at the Canoe Museum. Mm -hmm. If the city hadn't stepped up and put its money in, some of those charitable donations, and including that huge one, mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have happened or certainly wouldn't have been in the same amount. And that's a project where shovels are expected to hit the ground this year, too. So, Yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure it's this year or next year, but it, it can't be too far off. I, I, I talked with them a couple of weeks ago, I think, and I think it is this year, mm -hmm. I seem to recall. But... Uh, yeah, one of the ways in which the city is is uh, going to be adding to its coffers is with this PDI deal, the deal to sell PDI to Hydro One for $105 million. And there was a report on the General Committee's agenda the, uh, last night, uh, that's Monday night, um, and it was just primarily a report to update staff on what's going on with it right now, and... Um, what was mentioned, you know, afterwards, you know, I talked to Diane and uh, our story ended up being, you know, it doesn't seem as though council will be making any kind of motion to go back and try to reverse the deal. So it seems as though the deal is going through on the city's end. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, as I'm sure you're aware, I was in favor of the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, really, the way the whole thing was structured, I never thought we had a whole lot of choice to begin with. Uh, it was either sell off at a favorable price or have it taken from you at a less favorable price somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. That was made pretty plain. From the PDI standpoint, the, uh, the staff on the board there also made it plain that they were not sustainable in the long term. So I personally believe we made the right call. Yeah, John Stevenson, the president of PDI, he was at the council meeting and he had spoken about how the dividends from PDI had gone from over a million dollars to it was 700000 now. So it, It's been going down. Now, partially that was because they were not seeking uh, increases, mm -hmm. um, which is for the operational cost of, of the business while the negotiations were going on. They thought it was going to go faster and that it would then become up to Hydro One and then the 1% would kick in. Yeah, and I'm not sure. There was kind of a hitch in negotiations where it seemed that deal, the deal was put off. Hydro One had put out this big statement saying that 
the deal wasn't going to go through, and then all of a sudden the deal did come back together. So I don't know if that added added any length to the deal or... It, it didn't help. Uh, I know that Mary Bennett and uh, the chairman of the board and Mr. Stevenson went to Toronto and sat down with the chair of the board of Hydro One, who really got it going again. When they sat and talked, he had not been personally involved, but at that point he said, I don't see any real problem with getting this deal done. Okay. And they got it done. The The net proceeds from the, the community, or from the PDI, there's not been any formal discussion either with the staff or with PDI or uh, with council yet. But you're right about the numbers. It's 50 plus million dollars. Now, there's many different things that can be done. There's been people saying, well... Um, do this project or do that project, mm -hmm. um, save it off the taxes and so forth. Personally, I favor what John ha has talked about, which is to reinvest it into our generation. Mm -hmm. That keeps um, the utility growing. It employs people and it will allow him to do generation projects that he doesn't currently have the money for at a lower rate. He's offered us approximately 6% return on money. Well, the city with our reserves and so forth gets maybe half that. So to be able to invest that kind of money that way is quite exciting. PDI, you, you gave the numbers, $700,000 or so this year. 6% on 50 million is 3 million. Mm -hmm. That's three to four times easily what they're talking about. And that allows us to either do some of these projects, keep the tax increases down, but it comes back and benefits the people who paid for those utilities in the first place. Yeah, and you know, when uh, when there's definitely some new costs that come up or some new proposals for ideas, you know, there was uh, the proposal for a climate change fund, which uh, the funding for that's going to come via donations. Uh, that was talked about, and it may be possible, but I would think that if you're really going to do something, you got to go beyond just donations. Yeah, but uh, some of the ways that that, that group that uh, propositioned that to council, uh, they had said that you know funds from that could be driven from uh, casino revenues, and uh, you know there are always these groups that say, oh hey, uh -huh. this new revenue stream that you're coming into the city, you can use that to fund the thing we want. So of course. how quickly do you think, you know, you're going to have these groups and the departments that are kind of looking at uh, this funding and saying, well, geez, we can spend it here, here, and here. Like, I'm sure when that new funding comes into the city, you have a lot of different, you know, organizations and entities and people that are sure. trying to, to find ways to spend it. Yeah. And, and you know, the vast, vast majority of them are wonderful groups with great ideas. Mm-hmm. The problem is there's not enough money to go around. And that's where you have to try and prioritize based upon feedback from the public, uh, study by our professional staff and their best possible advice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was some uh, speaking of feedback from the public, but public engagement is something that uh, a lot of people during the uh, election cycle uh, that did get elected said that they wanted to see improved in the new council. It was something that the mayor, had, Diane Tarion, had campaigned on. And, uh, you know, what are some of the ways that we're kind of going to start seeing the new council be uh, kind of integrate itself a little bit more with the community or integrate, sorry, the community a little bit more with uh, the council cycle? There hasn't been a lot of discussion, but some of the things you can sort of see there, for instance, she appointed uh, Council Vassiatis to deal with, with some of those things. Mm-hmm. The new council cycle where we meet for two weeks, have a week off, and then meet again with the council to confirm the committee meetings is an opportunity for people to take that week and ask questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that they will about whatever was, was talked about. If they are not satisfied with them, or even if they are very satisfied, then they can come to council with, with an opportunity to speak that they will have been able to um, really flesh out what they want to talk about. They'll have facts as opposed to emotion and can come in and tell us what we're doing right or what we're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Now, one of the new things with this council uh, that was uh, was an item on the agenda the other night was a new code of conduct for councillors. And you actually had some comments uh, at that meeting uh, in response to that. So I'm kind of curious. Uh, I'm wondering if you want to kind of relay some what sure. your thoughts were that night. I, I'm thrilled to see it come forward. Uh, it was brought forward into the last term and only three of us voted to go ahead with it. And uh, former Mayor Paul Iatt wanted to bring one forward, but same thing, couldn't get the necessary support. I've noticed um, a deterioration in council's decorum. There's been four-letter words creeping in, including some that, while I may have heard in the locker room or when I was in the Army, they don't belong in a council chamber. Mm -hmm. That kind of conduct, can negatively impact public perception about the council, and it can impact the ability of a council to function. If someone is very aggressive, it can perhaps deter a, an inexperienced or, or um, laid back person from speaking out. Mm -hmm. And that can also impact. Do you realize that's why you hear through you, Mr. Speaker. Do you understand the tradition behind that? The idea is that if you're speaking to a neutral person, you can't get mad at the other person. I said, mm -hmm. that's the theory. But, but that's why it was imposed hundreds of years ago, in order to allow debate to go on about an issue, not about personalities. Now, when these four-letter words are creeping in, uh, is that, you know, when they're speaking through the speaker? Is that when, you know, occasionally I do see councillors, you know, they'll turn the microphone off because they're done speaking, and then maybe they'll have some comments that they share with the councillors beside them. Like, when are these kind of... No, they're, they're being said right out loud as part of, of council's uh, comments. Okay. Um, and it's, a, it's just totally inappropriate for what we're trying to do. We are the Board of Governors of a 300 plus million dollar corporation and we need to behave like that. And how does it make you feel when that isn't adhered to? I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, how does it make you feel when, you know, that that standard that you set for yourself as council isn't, uh, isn't adhered to and people do kind of break that decorum? It lessens the whole. And we become less than what we should be. We owe to the community to have a high standard of conduct, to set that example to our staff, and to demand it of ourselves. Okay. Now, i got a few more topics here on the list, but why don't we take a short break, refill on water, and then we'll come back in a few minutes? Absolutely. All right, excellent. I'm looking forward to it. So we're back on the Peter podcast and uh, I caught a couple more topics that I wouldn't mind exploring while we've uh, got you here in the studio. Let's go. Uh, Parkway, that, that P word that we were discussing <laughs> earlier. Um, there was an interesting motion uh, proposed by Councillor Acapo uh, to look at alternatives for the Parkway. Um, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on that motion and if it might, you know, start to, obviously they're if there's a recommendation for alternatives, that's something that council council will have to vote on. So it's not really the beginning of the end of the parkway as much as some people I'm sure would like it, but it's certainly the beginning of a new era of the conversation. Yeah, I'm not even sure it's a, a beginning of a new era. I'm thinking back to the previous council when the EA was rejected, the instruction from council to staff was look at all the things that we haven't done mm -hmm. because there are intersections and lanes and changes that were held up under the auguses of the uh, parkway that we couldn't do. And there are a number of traffic studies that uh, are being done right now, such as potential optimization of street lights and cycling lanes and all that yeah. kind of stuff that did result from that. All, all of that's important. My own thought is that um, I would build that section at the south end. I've mm -hmm. yet to really run into anybody that doesn't lo like that idea. Even very staunch anti-Parkway people have said, yeah, let's do that. And that was something that was mentioned at that meeting, which sadly I couldn't be there yeah. for. I just had to read up on it after. But yeah. uh, I don't even know if we can uh, do it. 
Yeah. Because that's... of the restrictions on piecemealing. Now, those restrictions uh, were placed by a previous provincial government, the Liberal provincial government, and obviously we have had a change in government. Do you think that the new progressive conservative provincial government would maybe take a second look at that and say, okay, well, it's not the whole parkway corridor, but if you want to build just the medical drive connection, sure, you can build that. They might be willing to talk, but they'll be under the same regulations um, unless they start changing laws. That's my understanding. Which, you know, having talked with uh, uh, MPP Lori Scott, she had mentioned that the province's goal is to slash the number of regulations in the province by 25%. So who knows, maybe one of those regulations that's holding up the parkway could get slashed. Yeah, maybe so. But Taylor, we've got so many exciting things we're doing in transportation, active transportation. Look at the bike lanes Mm -hmm. that we've put in, the way we've improved the transit, the walking and so forth. I still think ultimately somewhere that the parkway will be needed in some form. But even under the current studies, that north section is 20 years out. Mm -hmm. So while we continue to get people on bikes and on their feet and out of cars, that requirement is going to change. I think we need to preserve our options to see what way we're going to go. But let's see if people truly are ready to live what many talk about. Yeah. Begin to adopt alternative tr- modes of transportation, do you mean? Yeah, Use exactly. more transit? Okay. So basically kind of see where things go with this approach before we say whether or not the parkway is truly yeah. necessary. That's why when I hear people, well, are you for or against the parkway? In a sense, I don't know. Because I don't know what the city is going to be like 10, 15, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. What I am all for is good methods of transportation. You talked about it in the first part of the podcast, the ability to move around this community effectively. Goods, services, and people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's hard to say what the support for striking the parkway off the official plan would be because there hasn't been a vote along those lines in the new yeah. council um, but certainly the number of councillors who were in favor of the parkway have been reduced and there's a lot of new councillors who have expressed kind of uh, uh, favor against the parkway yeah. so uh, i imagine the support probably isn't there anymore for building the whole thing yeah, you could very well be right but key to everything is informed decision and i'm not trying to argue for against the parkway i'm mm-hmm. saying You can't make a decision on anything major unless you have a lot more information than the average citizen. Some of the new councillors yet won't have read or been briefed on some of the studies. You talked about the fact that people are starting to back off about PDI, and I agree with you. I I don't think um, some of the councillors that were campaigning on will stop the sale believe that now. They've been given more information. So we need to ensure that people are well-educated on all of the issues before they make a decision. And if that's to kill the parkway because that was the informed, wise decision based upon what we're projecting, so be it. But it needs to be an informed decision. So the decision then to pursue an alternative to the parkway, maybe build part of it, maybe build all of it. I know coming up with timelines with the parkway is, is like, throwing dice at a chessboard but uh (laughs) do you think that a decision on the parkway kind of a final decision will happen this turn (laughs) oh my god it's been (laughs) on the books for uh 70 plus years yeah who knows informed decision absolutely all right but uh yeah another topic and i talked with uh, gary baldwin a little bit about this um previous podcast but you know it was something that you brought up earlier so i figured let's talk about it is arenas we're currently at a deficiency of arenas uh there's that uh, one year delay to the arena that they were going to put up at trent university and then we've also got uh potential site selection happening for the uh memorial center oh i need memorial center replacement but the major yeah. sport and event center yeah um What's, uh, you know, looking at those two sites that are kind of the standout favorites, I mean, obviously there's six sites, but a lot of the conversation seems to be centered on either Morrow Park or 
that city works yard slash market plaza location. What are your thoughts on that? Money is going to be a huge driver of the thing. I, I mean, we're talking right now 80 plus million dollars to do the Memorial Center replacement, uh, close to 30 for the twin pad. We don't have either one of those. The The thing that really caused us to have to put the brakes on up at, uh, at Trent was the province saying that they were not going to come to the table. And this comes back to the budgetary issues that uh, we've been talking about, that the province is out of money too. Mm -hmm. And boy, is it, you can only tax people so much. And, uh, you know, th they have to be able to live and have a reason to get up and go to work. The major um, cost, apart from the building, would be land. Mm -hmm. And now I've just heard a, a number tossed around. I don't even know where it came from, but they were talking 30 to $50 million to buy land. That really, if you have to add that to the cost of building one, really tilts towards Moral Park, mm -hmm. simply from affordability and timing. Yeah, and I know uh, it was something our, our previous uh, mayor, Daryl Bennett, he had mentioned that he would like to see uh, a downtown arena. But obviously, that was at a time when there was less information about Market Plaza and uh, its availability. And uh, so I'm uh, I'm just wondering. So you say that cost is going to be one of the primary factors then Absolutely. in this decision. Absolutely. Uh, we do not have an unlimited supply of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that, only so much you can go to people and say, from your paycheck, we want or we need. Yeah, and from the sites uh, that were selected by the uh, consultants, you know, there were some areas that uh, would need to be purchased. You know, there was the General Electric lands. Uh, there was obviously the Market Plaza slash City Works Yard, which the city already owns the City Works Yard, but you're right, they would have to purchase the rest yeah. of the Market Plaza. Yeah, or come up with some convoluted design that fits it in there, and I don't, I don't even know if you can do it. Yeah, so then does that inherently favor those properties that the city already owns, such as, you know, James Stevenson Park was one location, and then, as we've already discussed, you know, Morrow Park? Yeah, James Stevenson is, is a non-starter, I'm quite certain. <laughs> But yeah, it, it, it will. Um, to use simple round numbers, eighty million if you own the land, one hundred and thirty million if you don't. When you don't have the eighty, one hundred and thirty is just that much further out of reach. Yeah, and I know I have heard from some uh, business proponents that you know just having a downtown arena would be a big boon to business downtown. But you know, putting it down the street in Morrow Park, which geographically it's not too distant but uh, obviously there's far less restaurants and kind of side businesses mm -hmm. nearby in, in an ideal world it would be great to put it in there mm -hmm. uh, but these are part of the, the compromises that council and staff have to deal with all the time what is the absolute end state that we'd like versus what's the reality that we can do yeah so that's definitely going to be a, a an interesting issue, and it's not something that's going to be wrapped up this year or even this I term. I wouldn't think so. Um, we did say to go ahead with the site selection. I admit I wondered, but by reducing the number of spots to look at, we lowered the cost significantly, and um, Mr. Seabrook was, was very convincing about the ability to attract interest something i hadn't really thought about until i started talking about it is when you build one of these and you then attract condos and apartments and businesses around it mm -hmm. to help make pay for it we all think of well how much is the ticket revenue from people going through the door how much can we make that way it's not a bad concept if it works yeah now, here's a question, and I believe this was a question that was raised by uh, Councillor Keith Riel at one of the, the previous meetings, but, you know, a lot there seems to be a lot of support, and I haven't talked to everyone on Council on this, but there seems to be some, some general support for Morrow Park, because it, it between it and Market Plaza, it is cheaper to develop Morrow Park because you already own the land. So what's the point of doing a secondary kind of uh, narrowing down of the sites if Morrow Park looks like it's going to be a, a favorite already? It looks, to be honest, I haven't made up my mind. Okay. Um, I would want to hear the pros and cons of both. 
you never know what might be in the balance on it. And I'm sure that there are others that are saying, well, sell me on it, tell me about it, explain it to me. All right. I, I thank you so much for sharing that because I know, I'm sure that Wal Morrow Park is definitely the cheaper site. And I'm sure, you know, as we talked about, money uh -huh. is the most important element. Knowing where our municipal councillors stand on, I haven't made up my mind yet, so I need more information. It, it definitely helps in establish where we are with that issue. In, th in theory, seldom in practice, but in theory, you should never make up your mind early mm -hmm. on something because you may miss a really good opportunity um, digging your heels in one way or the other on something. You just don't know what you're going to miss. All right. We could keep talking for another half hour, but I think I'm going to have to pack it in for the day. <laughs> um, so I'll leave it off with you. Is there anything else that you want to mention? No, but I really got? appreciate the time. I enjoy talking to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Henry, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. And to everybody else, we will see you again soon.